and all these things are wrong. But what makes the above statements wrong? Any ideas? Feel free to shout out. Creativity to solve problems. Sure, absolutely. I, okay. these, these are the ingredients for bad software. <laughs> like, these, these would all be true if we wanted to make bad software. You could, you could make software with these principles, but you wouldn't make software that many people would get a whole lot of value out of using. So uh, software is really, at the end of the day, it's about serving people. It's about finding, finding out what your user needs uh, and trying to make the thing that's best fitted to their purposes, their needs, and accomplishing what they want to accomplish. So once again, ask yourself that question. Why learn to make software? So I am not at all, in the remotest sense of the word, a born programmer. It's not something that came naturally to me. It's not something I grew up doing. It's not something I have a degree in. I, uh, I'm, I'm not at all the, 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 I, the idea of a person who is a born programmer. I was a musician all growing up. I, uh, I've been playing music since before, I mean, I've, I've been singing and playing music since before I could talk. Uh, I, you know, played piano and drums and bass guitar and all this stuff over the course of the years. I went and got a degree in music and I had this idea in my head, well, that's the only thing, that's the only career for me is doing that for a living. And so you hear this phrase a lot, do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. <laughs> well, uh, this, this is BS. It's total, total BS. Because what it really does is it, uh, it uh, what do you love? That, that's now a job. You've taken what you love, your passion in life, your raison d'etre, and you have turned it into a job. Um, it's much more important, uh, I mean, before I get to this next point, it's much more important to find your work interesting than it is to love your work. Now, that's not a, not a particularly uh, popular notion, and once again, I should have put another hot take alert thing on, on, on the board here, but it's true. So uh, I did that for a while. I did music and audio for a living for a while, and it tainted it kind of forever for me to the point where now I still kind of never find myself doing it for fun anymore, even years after getting out of the industry. And it's, uh, I mean, I've only in recent years kind of started getting back into it again. So I had a, sort of a failure to launch multiple times throughout my life where I was like, you know what, programming sounds like a great idea of something to get into. Uh, and there were a couple times in grade school learning, trying to learn basic. And then I took you know, some classes in high school that were clearly geared, uh, aimed towards the stereotypical I, you know, idea of what a programmer is from the last slide. Um, really, really left brain, really mathy, really alienating to someone with my temperament. And so I just kind of, and every time I tried to learn it, I'm like, I guess this just isn't for me, you know? I guess I, guess I, can't, I can't really do this. Now, part of, that is, part of that is my own fault, and we'll get into that. Um, because this happened. I, I gave up. I go, ah, you know, that's hard. I'm not going to do it. So this, this is really what I was a natural at. I was a natural at going, that's hard. I'm not going to do it. That's, that's what I was really a natural at. So, and I did it under the, under the guise of this idea. I'm finding my talents, you know, like, you know, the, the, you're, you're often told this idea by, by the world that, oh, you just, you know, you gotta find what you're, what you're naturally good at, and you just need to do that. And it's like, wow, that's a great recipe for never expanding yourself. Um, so, because it's code, it's just, this, this is what it's really code for. It's code for I don't like effort. Um, and that was kind of the story of Jake. Uh, all growing up, I uh, I was a re I was a fairly intelligent, talented person in the sense that enough things came easily to me, but I could always avoid things that didn't. You know, I could always avoid the things that didn't come easily to me. And so, learning to code when I came to Code Fellows was kind of kind of a shock. Like you're know, like, so why was I doing it again? You know, why was I trying to? learn code after I failed so many times to try and learn it in the past. Well, first of all, it's what I mentioned before. I hit the reset button on my career. I, uh, I uh, you know, my back was kind of against the wall, you know. I, uh, game industry sucks. 
uh, unless you're a CEO uh, or you know some, someone who doesn't do the actual like grind work of it. Um, and uh, you know there were, there were no jobs. You know like there, there I was you're always kind of no one ever says it explicitly when, when you when you work in the game industry industry but there's always the implicit. Well, there's people lined up around the block who want your job, so don't think you're in a bargaining position for money or you know a full-time position or anything like that. Um, so it was a necessity for me. I was, and I, for the first time in my life, giving up, which is what I'd been doing the whole my whole life up to this point, was no longer an option. I had I had a wife and kids and a mortgage, and uh, I was you know quick, we were quickly running out of money in our savings account and I really needed to ramp up fast and get into something that could support my family so I kind of resigned myself to the idea at first you know like ah, well I guess I'm I guess that's what I have to do now I'm selling out you know or whatever I had this idea that I was giving up on my dreams um, and luckily quickly uh, I learned that that wasn't necessarily the case um, so <laughs> When I first came to Code Fellows, it was uh, the jellyfication of my brain. Um, uh, but in a good way. So, uh, so coming here, I kind of had the saddest realization I think you could ever have when you're as far along in life as 32, which is, I've never done anything hard before. <laughs> Uh, it's really kind of it just it was I was really ashamed to make this realization like I'd been avoiding hard things my entire life so um, so the first week at, at Code Fellows I uh, it was it was you know fire hose of information I'm, I'm looking around the classroom and like I'm like I think everyone else is getting it but I'm not getting it holy crap this is a this is a big time and money commitment. I uh, make sure I should I be out there looking for just some crummy part time job instead of doing this, you know, like. And by the end of it, well, before I go on to the next bullet point, because I don't know how to go back. I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> I've never used this before. Um, but uh, by the end of the first week, I my brain. Cause I, I never I never felt your brain being tired before. <laughs> um, but by the end of the first week, I was sitting there, it was Friday night, and I had my laptop open on my lap in my living room, and I'm trying to work, and I couldn't remember anything about anything. Like, I couldn't remember how to index into an array. Like, I couldn't remember anything about it. I'm like, I guess it's bedtime, and I closed that, and then I had bizarre code-related fever dreams. Um, but every following week, kind of had a, a similar pattern. About midweek, I'd have this huge crisis, and I'd be like, this, this existential meltdown, where I'm like, oh my gosh, I think, I, I, I don't know if I can do this. Everyone else is getting it, I'm not getting it. Why are they getting it? Why don't I get it? Uh, and then by the end of the week, I'd kind of like, I'd kind of, you know, my, my, my uh, brain muscles would kind of relax a little bit, and uh, I'd be able to kind of be ready for another week. So eventually, I started being able to leverage uh, strengths and abilities that I picked up through um, uh, other interests that I'd had earlier in life. You know, strict. You know, it's hard to put this into words that, that make sense. But like, yeah, I, it felt like parts of my brain that I use when doing music and when studying philosophy, which were two loves of mine. Parts of those were getting activated, and I was able to to, to learn. Okay, you know, I can I can use that ability that I have there and that thing here. You know, and I and it's slowly over the course of the eight weeks uh, of the, at the time they called it the development accelerator um, I, over the course of the day, I basically rewired my brain uh, and so and I eventually kind of started realizing okay I think I could do this I think this is something I can accomplish and it was and it was this huge revelation to me because I'm like I've never gone from that step to that step before the Oh, this is hard. I don't think I can do this. Too. No, I can do this. I'd always just, you know, ejected, hit the eject button before getting to that second step. So I can do what? I can do. I, I can do hard things. Is the realization I had. Uh, it, yeah, it's embarrassing. I had never realized that before. So there's kind of a, a cult of this idea of talent 
in the world. And it's one of those things, I, it's like as a musician, when I, if I like, played a concert or you know, I showed somebody uh, an album I released or something, they'd go, oh, you're so talented. And I just, I mean, I'm, I'm glad they're giving me a compliment and I appreciate that they like what I did, but it's like, that's such a non-compliment. I can't control what talents I have. That's something I was born with. Like, I, I don't, don't give me compliments for something that I don't have any control over. You know, like, uh, you know, to, to kind of compliment people on putting in the work to become good at something. Don't, don't compliment them. Oh, you're a natural at that. Oh, cool. Thanks. My genes are, I guess my genes are interesting. I don't know. So, it, it, it got this idea, you know, as once I'd, you know, been doing the grueling work of finding my first coding job, and I'd had a little extra room in my brain to think about other things, I finally had this, this thought, you know, well, that was this really immensely hard, like, the hard, like, sadly, the hardest thing I'd ever done in my life. What else can I do that's hard? There, and then there's a whole list of things that I had written off for my whole life, pretty much. Just because I'm like, well, I'm not good at that, so I'm not gonna do it. But I was like, well, but I became good at this, so maybe I can try some other things. So, this was a big one, <laughs> getting up early. I'm just like, well, I'm just a night owl. I can't do it. Um, you can, you really can. It, it, it's, not, it's not easy to reset that clock, but, it's, uh, but you can. And it, it, it's still a challenge, but I'm totally capable of doing it now. Um, lifting weights, that's something I'm very into now. I was always like, well, I'm just, I'm just not a strong guy. You know, but no. Guess what? You can become strong. Uh, running. I'm like, oh, big guy. Big guys don't run. That's just not. That's not how you do it. You know, it's bad for my joints or something. <laughs> um, which you know, sure, it's a little hard on your joints, but you learn to get, you learn to, to run in the correct way, and, and it alleviates that. Um, martial arts. I'd always been like, oh, he's so good to learn a martial art, but I just, I'm just, you know, I don't got the right type for that and stuff. And uh, home renovation. My wife and I this last summer completely redid our entire kitchen ourselves uh, with no experience whatsoever. So yeah, it was definitely a learning experience, I'll tell you what. But man, a lot less expensive than paying someone to do it. Um, and playing string instruments. I, another thing that I had tried and given up on multiple times in the course of my life, because I just, my left hand is dumb. It just, it just does not do stuff right. And, but I taught, taught myself, taught myself to, uh, to play the ukulele started doing martial arts, started running, started lifting weights, doing all these things that I'd always just written off as things that I couldn't do. And in recent years, uh, in this last year, like putting, releasing some of my own open source software libraries. So it's, uh, these are all things I didn't think I would ever do. I just, even at the beginning of my career as a programmer, I'm like, well, I'm just, I'm just gonna be a peon and just kind of just float along. But uh, I, got, I got a taste for achievement. I got a taste for, oh, wait, seeing something that's hard, deciding to do it anyway, and sticking with it is valuable. And so with more data, as I, as I started doing more and more hard things, uh, you know, more data, you can see bigger patterns emerge. And, and so there's, there's something to be learned from making a habit of doing things that are difficult. And uh, first of all, you learn that you can do it almost anything if it's, you know, logically possible. You know, I can't fly unaided. That's definitely something that's, that's never gonna happen. You know, the world that you live in definitely provides limits, meaningful limits, but limits, you know, like there's no option for me to be a uh, knight, you know, that's just not a thing that I can be <laughs> in, in the society in which I live. But outside of world-based and logic-based exclusions, there's not a lot of things that can't be done. And, and it's, and, and not just that it can't be done, but because it can't be done by you. Um, another thing is I, I learned is that confidence is a choice. It's, it's if, you, if you feel really unconfident and, and anxious as a, as a person, it's something that, that, just, that just does not compute. And my whole life, I, that, was, that was the thing. I'm like, well, once X happens, then I'll feel confident. That's not how confidence works. Confidence is the decision that Regardless of what's in front of you, you will choose to keep working at it. Uh, and it, I mean, like, it's just like the idea of courage. Courage. There's no such thing as being courage if you're not also scared. You know, it's like, there's, so there's nothing as, as confidence if you're not also a little bit intimidated. So another thing I learned is that, uh, that there's a mental shift that happens, whereas you look at problems, 
problems suddenly start becoming opportunities to, to do things. It's like, oh, it's no longer like, well, that's hard, uh, that, that thing's there, uh, well, I guess we can't do this. It's like, ooh, how can I come up with a clever solution to this? It becomes a, 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 like a challenge. Um, and then it also makes you become a little more invested in the world around you. Um, I think it was the philosopher John Locke who said, you know, came up with the idea of, you know, like, you can, you can live on a piece of land, but once you, once you mingle your effort with it, it kind of becomes, you know, more little piece of property. And it's the idea of you invest yourself in something, you intermingle your efforts with it, you, you, you make it important to you, and you are that much more, you care that much more about the world around you and the people around you and the needs of the people around you. Um, also, achieving goals is super exhilarating. It's, it's a, like, actually, the actual achievement of the goal is kind of a fleeting moment of excitement. But the number one lesson I've learned from all this is that working towards challenging goals has value in, in and of itself. And, uh, and that's a lasting, that, that's a much longer form uh, pleasure and fulfillment is the fulfillment you feel from just working towards a goal. Because once you achieve, achieve a goal, and it's like, that's exciting for you know, a day, tops, and you're like, oh, what, 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 what am I doing now? So, this, this is one thing I'd like you to take away from this, is that the work itself is valuable. So, uh, there's a quote from Friedrich Nietzsche, he says, a man with a why to live can bear with almost any how. Which is the idea of, if you, if you have something that you're invested in, something that you're working towards, something that you care about, the, 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 uh, you, you won't be suddenly crushed by things not going perfectly or going well in your life. Um, happiness itself is a fleeting and a slippery goal. Like, it's kind of like, like it, it, that's one of the things that bothers me so much about the whole uh, idea of uh, pickup artists. They have this idea of getting chicks, man. I'm like, yeah, that's not really that's not really a goal you should center your life around. You should maybe put, put center your life around being an excellent person, and then maybe you'll find someone you'd like to invest time in your life with. Um, and so happiness is the same way. Happiness, if you if you make it your goal, if that's the thing that you're focusing on, it's elusive. But you, if you seek to do to find and do meaningful things. Happiness is a natural byproduct of it that happens. But coming back to the Nietzsche thing, if you have a why, the how doesn't, doesn't matter as much. You can bear with almost any difficulties or things that happen in your life uh, if, uh, if you're working towards something that you find meaningful. I mean, how many of you have been writing code? I mean, I don't know how long, it, how many of you have been doing this, but uh, you get really involved in the issue and then like time sort of slips away. You're like you get really in, in, in you're you're so you don't, you're not hearing any of the conversations around you that you get in that flow state. That's what I'm talking about. So continuous improvement is something that's absolutely necessary in the software development world because software is always changing, new requirements are coming out, new expectations come from the users. So if you make goal seeking a part of who you are, it'll, it's never going to be a burden. You know, like remember when I first you know got my first job, I'm like, oh my gosh. How am I going to find the time to keep up with all this stuff? Because oh gosh, that sounds so exhausting. But it's never exhausting because it's it's like because I'm interested. I'm very, I'm interested in it. I'm focused on it, and, and it becomes a thing that that, that, that drives me itself. Um, uh, and if you're now if you get your first job uh, or second or third or whatever, and your employer, your boss, your manager, or whatever doesn't ask you to set goals for your for for the year for what you want to accomplish, do it on your own because this is an absolutely huge thing um, for two, two big reasons. One, it's a way for you to measure your progress, to go, okay, am I accomplishing what I'm setting out to do? And remember the whole uh, begin with the end in mind? If you, are you, are you, it's a way for you to go, am I, re am I getting towards that thing that I set out to do? And the other thing is, if you ever wanna ask for a raise, you've got a written record of all the stuff you accomplished. So, uh, and uh, setting goals, huge, big do it whether or not your boss tells you to so in the end you can do it uh, you can do hard things you really can uh, and you know for a lot of you it's probably not the huge revelation that it was to me um, and I I am glad for those of you who it's not a huge revelation to because uh, you're a better person than I am 
Um, even do things are hard. And learning software, learning to make software is hard. Like, I mean, who in this room thinks everything they've, they've, been, they've learned so far in GoFellow is, is, was really easy to just understand immediately? <laughs> yeah, crickets, that's right. Uh, so you can learn to make software. You know, you can things that are hard, making software is hard, you can learn to make software. Whether or not you feel at the moment like, you're, like you can. Um, so we are engineers and craftsmen, craftswomen, uh, craftspeople, I, I don't know. Um, but that, that's what we do, and so, and software is for people. So at the end of the day, why make software? A hard thing, it's a hard thing to do. Why do it for people? And the answer is because people, yourself included, are worth the work. It's worth investing yourself in the, the, um, the joy and the ability of the people around you, and worth investing in it for yourself as well. So, so now, what you have to go to do is decide which people and what work and do that work. So, that's it. Questions? And I'll, and I'll tell all of you the same thing that I tell people when I, when I teach Sunday school, which is oh. I'm perfectly comfortable awkwardly smiling at you, and uh, I'm, I'm perfectly comfortable with awkward silences. So I'll make you all comfortable by looking you in the eyes and smiling at you if you don't, have any, if you don't ask questions. So uh, feel free to ask questions. I'm, I'm open to any kind of questions. What um, things do you think that you have used from your maybe musical artistic side, not necessarily the school, but that um, craft side to be able to use that in uh, coding as well? So one thing, like writing code, even if you're not writing anything UI related, one thing that you would be surprised matters a whole lot is aesthetics. You know, your code being presented in a way that is readable. I mean, cause like, it's really easy to write code that works, that looks like garbage. Like it's really, it's, it's difficulty is writing code for people, because that's what you, in, in the end, you're writing code for, for people. You're not, I mean, like, if you were, if you were writing, writing something that you, you're only gonna ever see the code once, then sure, write it any garbage way you wanna write it. But you are writing it for other people to read. You're not just writing for the compiler, you're not just writing for the interpreter, you are writing for other programmers, even if that other programmer is you from three months from now, or you a year from now. So aesthetics are a huge thing. Uh, and you know that includes symmetry. That includes um, organization. Like those are all things that like it's like oh man, this this code file is ugly. And when I make it look nice, suddenly uh, you know patterns emerge. You know like when it, so when you when you have standards, uh, suddenly it's like if you standardize the way you write your code, then anomalous things pop out. Um, so there, there's that. Also um, there's a lot. So I said you know I'm not really mathy left brain person but the thing about uh music is that music takes a lot of those those mathy things and kind of makes them intuitive you know so like you're doing something that's, that's that has a ton of math underpinning it but at the end of the day uh like you don't actually interact with the math in, in a way that feels like you're doing math um, and so like it allowed me to kind of think at a higher, a little like higher level instead of like a nitty gritty level about um, algorithmic things and about you know how certain data structures work and stuff like that. So it uh, the, the, the I'll, I'll sum that all up in one sentence. Uh, the capacity for abstraction that the arts provides definitely helps with writing code because writing code is all about abstraction. Anybody else? Geocaching uh, was actually pretty pleasant. Um, it uh, th there was no huge uh, like like Amazon style, you know, like awful whiteboard interview. There were a couple of questions like, how would you do this? How would you do that? Like it was a lot of it was very like high level. It's just like well, say you want to do writing class that did this and this, um, and it was going to be used in this way. How would you write it? And being able, so that's something that I, I didn't spend a, a lot of time. I'll wait. So that's something I didn't uh, I didn't spend a lot of time talking about, and I wish I'd spent a little more time talking about my presentation. Which is that, man, oh man, social skills matter when you are an engineer. Like, 
that 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 whole that whole stereotype is wrong that you don't need that you definitely need that and the reason is that developing software is a very social endeavor and trying to immediately get across to a potential employer what your skill set is what your understanding level is and all that is a highly social endeavor I mean, without sitting there as a member of the team for a week writing code and checking it in and doing pull requests, that's, that, that's you know, this is the best system we have. It's not a great system, but it's the system we have for, for hiring people. And uh, so if you really wanna help do yourself some favors, spend lots of time, not just writing code, but talking about the code you're writing, explaining to people, rubber ducking, doing, doing stuff where you're used to talking at a high level, like at just a, a abstract level about, oh yeah, this is how I would architect this, this is, you know, I use this pattern, uh, uh, I would test it this way, blah, blah, blah. So be, be, I, got, I got used to when, uh, the job before that, working at Nordstrom, where it was a 100% pair programming, 100% uh, of the time, um, and uh, test-driven development house. And so like, I spent all day, every day, talking about code, and that helped me a ton for interviewing the second, you know, when I was looking for my second full-time gig. Um, and it made that second job hunt a bazillion times easier. So much easier. So if, if you don't do it now, get in the habit of talking regularly. Do some, practice doing some, some pair programming. It will, it will help you a ton. It, now, I'll tell you right now, it's mentally exhausting. Absolutely mentally exhausting. I would go home, like the first like three months at, that, at Nordstrom, I just came home just drained every day. And I was like falling asleep off at my desk just because like it, my, my brain was consuming so many calories. And so, yeah, it's, but get in that habit. Get in the habit of talking about engineering, um, ex, you know, at a high level. And it will, it will do wonders for you explaining your worth to employers. Like to show your um, your open source libraries? Oh, uh, sure. Yeah, I can. I can show you the one that's the most finished. Um, so I I work with a couple different you know, Promise future libraries um, in, in Objective C. And when I first came to you know when I first switched back so when I went when I went to Codefellows it was the when. Swift had just been announced, and they're like, yep, we're gonna start you off with Swift right from the beginning. You know, with Swift 1, it was garbage, and it crashed your, crashed the compiler all the time, and um, so I learned Swift first, and then I found Objective-C, and I'm like, no, this, these are my people. And uh, and then I was worked in Objective-C for a long time, and I, so I kind of came back to Swift later, warily going, ah, Swift is just a buggy piece of crap, but I tell you now, I freaking love the language. and. But, but one of the ways that I was like, okay, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna really get myself in a swift first mindset was I'm like, well, I'm gonna take my experience using these other like Objective-C promise libraries and go, I'm gonna, make, I'm gonna write that in Swift um, but uh, without referencing their code. So I remember the behavior of how, how those libraries worked, what it was like using them. So I gave myself this challenge of, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that, but in a swift way without looking at their source code, just remembering how it worked. And so that was what I did. And README files are my version of blogging. That's how I, I love I love writing really conversational uh, README files. So I built this library called Concurrency, um, which I'm sure will become completely irrelevant once uh, Swift adds all those uh, basic features that they've been talking about for years now. But um, but it's uh, I mean I don't, I don't know what all you'd like me to show because you know it's, I know we're in a diverse room full of you know like we have JavaScript people and. What all, I don't know what all languages we got in here, but uh, but uh, oh, I think here. Let me see if I can. So like, there, there's a, there's there's a problem that happens a lot in, in Swift. Where where is it? Where you get in these kind of pyramids of doom, you know, like, uh, and it often happens with you know with uh, you're trying you know you're doing something like I need to do this, but it relies on this, and it relies on this, and it relies on this. So once this is done, then it just comes back here, and you get this really, really ugly thing. What uh, this promise library uh, allows you to do is to, um, instead of worrying about a, a callback block that you have to like 
hand originally is you have a, an object, an actual object, that represents that whole bit of asynchronous work. And you can just say, okay, when this is done, you know, you're, well, first of all, I'm gonna, I'm gonna immediately hand you this object the second you, ask, you, you, you ask for this asynchronous work to be done. And you have this immediately synchronously. And once it's done, it'll tell you that it's done. And that way you can hand, you know, like if, if you're going four functions deep, this thing finishes, and then it goes, I'm done, and, and, and it's, it, it ha it's holding onto the same object that all the other ones are holding onto, and it just pops off, bump, 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 bump. So you never have to like have all of these completion blocks all in one place. Each of them just happen in their own place. So you get a lot more um, flat structure in your, uh, in your asynchronous work. Um, I could probably talk about this forever, but I, I don't wanna, like, this is a lot of, really domain specific stuff. What's that? I have a question about that. So sure. Swift natively doesn't have promises? No, no it does not. I mean, I don't, is there a language that does? I mean, JavaScript, I think it's still, it's still a library, right? Uh, that's they, they're native now. They're, oh, they're really? Native. Oh, yeah. Shows how much I know about JavaScript. <laughs> <laughs> JavaScript scares me. Uh, <laughs> I'm, especially because it's, it's kind of like the exact opposite of Swift, where Swift is super duper strongly typed and pretty much you push pretty much all of your problems to happen to be addressed at, at compile time so that at runtime there's almost there's very few things that are going to cause problems at runtime in swift that's just the way the language is built um but no it doesn't they, they, that's one thing they, that's in the swift evolution um thing on github is they're talking about adding um the async await this is the thing that they're talking about and which is really cool. I don't think it'll solve all the problems. Like I think it, I think it's more of a threading thing than it is an asynchronous work thing. Like 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 you're gonna, I don't think you really handle network calls that way. Um, but uh, but yeah. So yeah, no, it's not built into the language. Completion blocks are, but that's, that's, what like blocks are, but yeah, like, yeah. Uh, and under the hood, this uses blocks. But uh, and it really, I've built a lot of syntactic sugar into it so that it's it's really just you know. You only use you only have to like call the blocks that you need. So it's like if all you care about is if, when it succeeds and, and if, when it fails, you don't want anything to happen. Well, you only have to implement the success block. Right. Just go promise dot on success done. Anybody else? Technical non technical personal question. <laughs> <laughs> no. Cool. Well, feel free to. Uh, I'll. I'll Somebody give me their email address and I will hand these slides off for whoever's interested. Um, feel free to uh, reach out on any of these platforms. No, I'm not going to give you my personal email address, but I will. I, I do answer all, you know, respond on all these platforms. So uh, feel free to reach out. Um, thank you for letting me come speak to you today.